You know, I've often heard people describe the book of James as being like the New Testament version of the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. And the idea is that it has, it doesn't have really what we call a didactic form. It doesn't go from point to point that's interconnected. Uh, like Paul's letters, I mean, he, he really starts one place and he progressively moves through the issues in a very orderly fashion. Uh, usually Paul's letters are divided into two main sections. The first part is the theological section and the last part is the practical application of that theology. How do I live that out day to day in my life? Uh, and they, we look at the book of Proverbs and it kind of moves from things to theme to theme and makes it one of the most difficult books of the Bible to expound upon, although I'm contemplating giving it a shot here um, after we finish the book of James. You can pray that God would give me direction because it's so rich with advice on daily living. I, I read it every day, a chapter every day, and I would recommend you do the same. But having said that, uh, I don't think James is actually that close to Proverbs because I think it is really set in an orderly progression. And I think it's when he comes in verse 9, for example, where we are today, that he says, the brother in humble circumstances ought to, be, ought to take pride in his high position. And he begins by talking about the issue of humility. Uh, humility is, is one of those central issues of the Christian life that none of us really like to think about. Um, there's probably nothing that's more unnatural to the human uh, character than to be humble. Uh, we come into the world demanding our way. I mean, I, I don't want to put down babies, but the reality is the baby has only one concern, and that's his or her warmth, comfort, and welfare. And, and we leave the world with, with nothing really to show for it if we have, in fact, given our life to Christ. And that really becomes the thing that Paul is, or excuse me, James is trying to emphasize because he said the guy who is in humble circumstances, in other words, he's financially challenged. He, he's in a position socially and economically where uh, he is at the bottom of the rung or very close to that. And what we have to understand is in the biblical world, uh, up and through the New Testament, even until very modern times, there really wasn't this thing called the middle class. Everybody was in humble circumstances, except for the 1% who are on top. And so, you know, that was actually easier in some way, because I could look around at everybody who was like me, and they were struggling just like I was, and it created a sense of community in our shared suffering and struggling. But in our day-to-day -day where we see such segmented diversification within the stratification of economic and social status, uh, it can be really maddening and it really drives the whole American way of life of upward mobility. But here's the problem. When you give your life to Christ, he's really put you on a different trajectory. It's kind of a path of downward mobility and maybe not so much economically, but in a sense socially. Uh, I love the way Gail Irwin used to put it. He says, I have many friends in low places. You know, we, we like to boast. Well, I know so-and-so and I know so-and-so. And he says, well, I, I don't have people in high places. I just have people like you who are in low places. And it's that recognition that we are people of humble circumstances that is really the key, I think, to being at peace and knowing joy. The man who is, sees himself or herself in, in a high position feels like they have a right to demand their way. And, and don't we do that a lot, where we just, how dare they treat me or talk to me that way, or don't they know who I am, and I deserve this, and I deserve that. Um, and it's, <laughs> it becomes this whole idea that we're somehow owed so much for life because we're supposed to be in a higher position, not only economically and socially, but even relationally. Uh, I often think about how that uh, we often talk, I, I love the, uh, the, the whole concept of, you know, understanding another person's love language. What, what does love sound like or look like in the life of someone else? And so we say, well, you need to learn the love language of that other person. But I think there's a greater challenge and a greater level of love that you have to come to. And that's how do you love that person when they're not speaking your love language, when they're not interested in speaking your love language, when uh, they just uh, don't care? How do you how do you react? To that? Do, you, do you still love them? And see, this is where we begin to put qualifiers in life that we say certain things are owed to me. And suddenly in a marriage relationship, we sit back and say, well, my spouse isn't treating me the way I should be treated. The, the answer is, how should you be treated? And the answer is, you should be treated as a servant of Christ. So it's this, uh, 
crazy concept. It's kind of like, again, as someone put it, that, that downward mobility of life that we find ourselves chafing against on a regular basis. And this is where James kind of covers both sides of the equation when he says the, the brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. What high position? His high position in Christ. It's interesting because in the Gentile churches of the first century that many times a slave would be the pastor of the church and the church would meet in the home of a wealthy benefactor. And so it was really played out that this was a classless society that was not based upon any of the usual measurements of a culture, but it was based upon the will and the calling and the purposes of God. And that's why we find in the letter to Philemon, if you read it, Paul is writing to Philemon, who is a man of substance, and he, Paul is a man of no substance, and he's speaking to him as, as an elder, as one who has precedent over him. And so I think we need to understand that God has called us to seek to be first and foremost uh, the high position of servanthood, not the high position of being served. And then he goes on, contrary to that, or in contrast, he says, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position. In other words, God has entrusted the man of wealth with the things of this world. And Paul is simply saying that those who are entrusted with things of this world uh, do not have as nearly an important role in the kingdom as those who are entrusted with the spiritual things of this world. Uh, the man who is, as he later talks about, rich in faith toward God, he said the poor are rich in faith toward God, why? Because they have to rely upon prayer. They can't just write a check or pass the credit card. And so he says you have to understand that what men esteem is often lowly valued, the scripture says, by God. And the things that we value the most are the things that God just kind of like, hmm, no big deal. Because he said, here's the problem. The things of this world will pass away like a wildflower. In other words, they, they wither very quickly. They sprout up, and before you know it, they're gone. Well, uh, we're out of time, so looking forward to this. I'm enjoying this conversation. I hope you are, and we'll continue as we look at verse 11 in our continuing study of James chapter 1.